Okay, uh, so my name's Greg Lionel. I'm from the English department at Liverpool. I'm also the um, co-director of what we call the Literature and Science Hub, which is a research grouping, um, mainly centred in the English department, but, but spreading outwards as well. Um, I'm also here to represent the BSLS, which is the British Society for Literature and Science. We were founded, I think, in 2005. Um, if you don't know about us, do have a look on our web website, um, which has, over the years, become a fantastic repository for um, reviews. We have an annual conference um, every Easter or round about then. Um, we also have an annual winter symposium, um, which is normally organised by doctoral and or postdoctoral researchers um, who propose a particular theme. Uh, this year we'll be in Liverpool um, in November, November the 16th, um, and the theme is Extinctions and Rebellions in Literature and Science, um, and the, the call for that will go out very soon. Okay, so my, my paper um, is, is kind of less about reading renewables and more about re narrating re renewables, specifically solar. And I want to look at three connected stories of solar power um, and see how they kind of draw imaginative energy um, from each other. I'm going to start with a quotation. The fight goes on between Dame Nature and the scientists. Whether we shall ever have an efficient solar boiler and engine is a problem worth thinking about, and a very interesting one at that, as you possess no greater source of natural energy to be had without taxation or special leases from some money-grabbing, coal, oil or other baron than that of the sun. Some day we may be able to derive all necessary light and power, for our homes at least, by means of a solar electric plant located on the roof. And who shall say that we must be taxed for utilising such energy. Now Hugo Gernsback's uh, article, written for his own magazine, The Electrical Experimenter, raises issues that have pervaded discussions of, of solar power throughout the 20th century and, and continued into the 21st. Transitioning to levy-free solar power after coal, gas and petroleum, that mysterious earth oil, seem not only economical and libertarian, but also a logical progression. Since, asked Skernsback, what are they, i.e. fossil fuels, but transformed sunbeams? Framing a speculative technological narrative also as an economic one, Gernsback sees the adoption of solar as involving a shift away from the state or corporate run grid based energy supply and towards the individual producer slash consumer, what 21st century energy economists clumsily call presumption, apparently. Um, imagining absolute energy justice, he assumes that solar cannot be monopolised, that the technology to harness it, like the sun itself, will be available to all. Moreover, writing for an audience of scientists and engineers, Gernsback sees the means of achieving this lying solely in their hands, not within a network of different agents. The Promethean, anthropocentric narrative of the individual, normally male scientist seeking to conquer dame nature, frames much of how 20th, 20th century science fiction tries to understand solar energy and its technological capture. Now, by, by solar boiler, Gernsback has in mind inventions like Augustin Mouchot's, which had been displayed at the 1878 Universal Exposition in Paris, and which had attracted French government funding for a time. By solar, solar electric, Gernsback is thinking of selenium's photovoltaic properties, which had been discovered by Willoughby Smith in 1873. Now, selenium's potential for power generation um, took some time to be taken seriously, given that the cells were only 1% efficient. But certainly by the 1890s, the direct transformation of the radiant energy of the sun into electrical energy began to be called one of the dreams of the modern scientist. And we have the engineer, Rollo Appleyard, um, imagining in 1891 the blessed vision of the sun no longer pouring his energies unrequited into space, but by means of photoelectric cells and thermopiles, these powers gathered into electric storehouses, to the total extinction of steam engines and the utter repression of smoke. So this narrative was not only a quasi-divine, sublime fantasy of energy abundance, 
but also a kind of technological survival of the fittest, which coal was destined to lose eventually. And as the 20th century dawned, science fiction began to explore the possible futures of such a transition, no matter how far away um, it seemed. Now, Hugo Gernsback was of, was, of course, a key figure in the development of science fiction. He founded a whole roster of magazines, uh, particularly Amazing Stories, started in 1926, um, dedicated to publishing the genre he called scienti fiction. Moreover, many of his ostensibly scientific and technical titles also featured SF stories from time to time. And they encouraged a culture of speculative invention and futurology that hovered between fact and fiction, including in the area of, of solar energy. In the solar narratives um, established by early 20th century science fiction, the harnessing of this power via feats of architecture and engineering functions as a sort of synecdoche for technologically driven human futures, characterised by sustainability and or um, environmental catastrophe. And so we have solar technology such as solar power uh, space stations as important plot devices in the often clunky and reactionary yet frequently visionary and technically astute pulp SF stories from the late 20s, uh, 30s, 40s. But in many such narratives, solar power scenarios operate as kinds of thought experiment that consider the possible ethical, operational, economic, social dilemmas uh, associated with renewable and other forms of energy. And I think some of Isaac Asimov's stories are probably the best examples of those. So Gernsback and others sort of cultivate a print culture in which a diverse um, set of solar energy imaginaries could flourish. Um, and they encourage interest and investment, but also fraudulence, which I'll, I'll come on to. Now, Gernsback had not always wanted to be a publisher. In 1904, he emigrated from Luxembourg to the USA, um, hoping to manufacture a new form of battery he had invented. Now, that project failed to fly, and he established magazines about gadgets um, instead, starting with Modern Electrics, in 1908, succeeded by the electrical engineer, the electrical experimenter that I've already quoted from. And Gernsback's publications, of course, captured a whole new phenomenon and audience. Uh, since between the 1890s and 1920s, three quarters of the US became um, electrified. Um, and modernity progress, you know, were manifested in this illuminated urban environment. Um, and it was a a place of electrical sublimity, sometimes said to be emulating the sun. So on a visit to New York in 1910, Ezra Pound saw squares after squares of flame, for we have pulled down the stars to our will. Now, for one of his magazines, Modern Electrics, in 1911-12, Gernsback wrote the 12-part serial Ralph 124C41+, a romance of the year 2660. And it adopts the common motif of the foreign visitor to a land of the future. Um, and much of the story consists of the eponymous American hero showing the Swiss woman and love interest, Alice 212B423, around New York, focusing particularly on its advanced electrical technologies. So Gernsback presumably saw um, a serialised fiction as a way to increase interest in the title. Um, and nearly every month's cover featured an illustration derived from one of the, the story's episodes. Um, republishes a novel in 1925, uh, Gernsback's story has received a critical drubbing over the years. Um, but I think we should perhaps view it less as a, as, a, as a novel and, I don't know, more as a kind of speculative technography or something, or a textual world's fair or something like that, um, since credited with numerous successful predictions of technology. Um, that doesn't make it any more enjoyable to read, though. I don't know whether any of you have, have, have read it. Um, now, what keeps this um, techno-utopian post-oil New York running is an immense solar energy station of 12 monstrous Meteoro Towers, each 1,500 feet high, forming a hexagon inside of which were the immense heliodynamophores, so sun power uh, bringers. Now, if this prospect were not technologically sublime enough, 
the narrator describes how the entire expanse, 20 kilometers square, was covered with glass. Underneath the heavy plate glass squares were the photoelectric elements, which transformed the solar heat direct into electric energy. And goes on. Each square meter contained 400 photoelectric elements with 1,600 units placed in heliostat-like cases, which sort of track the sun. And Gernsback's, you know, idea kind of resembles the solar power tower systems now placed in desert um, locations. Um, fawningly, Alice remarks that they have similar plants in Europe, but not of such magnitude. It really is colossal. Um, the scale of this development is kind of further proof of what we gradually realise is the story's maxim, that nothing is impossible in America. So the power station's monstrousness is wholly positive. It enables American materialism to thrive into the future. Now, the crucial thing is that Ralph provides Alice with a history of solar power to explain how such a technological marvel is possible. In 1909, Cove of Massachusetts invented a thermoelectric sun power generator which could deliver 10 volts and 6 amperes in a space of 12 square feet. But it was not until the year 2469 that the Italian 63A1243, we never get, we never get their, their, their um, name, invented the photoelectric cell which revolutionised the entire electrical industry. This Italian discovered that by derivatives of the radium M class in conjunction with tellurium and octurium, a photoelectric element could be produced which was able to transform heat direct into electrical energy without losses. So Gernsback includes not only spurious chemical elements, but also a real life example the readers of modern electrics may well have encountered. A solar electric generator had indeed caused a splash in the New York press in 1909. Probably the most detailed report came from the nature writer and novelist Winthrop Packard for the Technical World magazine. Using the sun's energy for heat and power is a dream that would seem to be as utopian as any magic feat of the genie of Arabian tales and yet has apparently now been realised. Appearing before the startled scientific world is the invention of a Massachusetts man, George H. Cove, which proceeds along entirely new lines and lays a simple but cunning and effective trap for the electrical energy which the sun generates. And the article continues in this hyperbolic vein, and it reads more like a promotional feature, really, suggesting that Packard might have fallen into a bit of a trap himself. We get a very lengthy but opaque description um, of the device included as well. Uh, a primary cell of a three inch long alloy of several common metals, on, on one end of which the sun shines, the other end being in the shadow. Um, it's then part of a circuit wired in the ordinary, ordinary way to any good storage battery. And it's, it's that temperature differential um, between the cell's two ends that, that generates electricity. Although this action is not wholly understood by the inventor. Like Gernsback's narrator, Packard makes sure to impress upon the reader the scale and numerousness of this device. It consists of a frame very like a sash with 16 panes, each pane enclosing the somewhat end of 61 plugs, a total of 976. But unlike the power station of 2660, no tracking hel heliostats are needed. The movement of the sun away from a perpendicular position causes no heat loss. Furthermore, Cove's machine will cost little more than $100, is as indestructible as a kitchen range, and with two days sun, will store sufficient electrical energy to light an ordinary house for a week. Now this all sounded too good to be true. And sure enough, it was. So around that time, Cove filed a patent and was trying to raise capital from New York investors. In October 1909, he was apparently kidnapped and offered a fortune if he ceased promoting his device. However, one of the alleged kidnappers claimed that Cove himself had arranged the incident as a publicity stunt. Then we have in August 1911, Cove and his share selling agent arrested for alleged fraud. Not only had Cove made false claims about the number of customer orders, 
but when one of the roof, rooftop demonstration machines was examined, its storage battery was found to be connected to the mains. So that, now the thing is that the Ralph Passage celebrating Cove appeared less than a month later in Modern Electrics with the heliodynamophore plant illustrated on the front cover. So I think even if Gernsback had heard about Cove's arrest, it was presumably too late to amend this publication. Now Cove's initial success in defrauding his investors and the press was perhaps partly due to the prominence at this time of another, but in this case genuine, solar entrepreneur Frank Schumann. Schumann's designs were not photoelectric but steam-based, but in outward appearance I suppose Schumann's glass bo boxes could be mistaken um, for coves, perhaps explaining why Cove was able to exploit sort of parasitically the permeable boundary between technological innovation and fraudulent um, fantasy. Unlike Cove, Schumann had a proven track record, hundreds of patents, uh, may, many involving glass manufacture to support any grandiose claims he might make. And by at least 1908, knowledge of his work um, on solar technology had spread widely in popular journals. Um, his financial backing came from British investors and the solar power company in 1912 started to build an immense power plant in Egypt, just south of Cairo. Um, Schumann incorporated parabolic trough-shaped reflectors reminiscent of John Erickson's concentrators from several decades before. Um, the plant in Egypt comprised five large collectors, each 200 feet long, 13 feet wide. Um, they could track the sun apparently with gears powered by steam. Um, properly tested in July 1913, um, the plant produced more than 55 horsepower and it excited an audience including Lord Kitchener. Now crucially, the thing that I'm interested in is that Schumann's solar campaign was also carried out in print in popular science magazines. So several pieces for Scientific American explain the rationale for the power plant and turning to the sun for energy more generally and gave detailed descriptions of his devices. Significantly though, the majority of these were in the form of letters sent to correct what Schumann saw as misrepresentations of what he was doing. Writing in February 1914, Schumann was particularly concerned about the narrative of futurity that seemed to dominate discussions. Sun power is now a fact and is no longer in the beautiful possibility stage. It can compete profitably with coal in the true tropics now. But he also argued the technology should be given time to develop. The steam boiler has had 150 years to reach 75% at best in efficiency. In seven years, our method has already reached an efficiency of 57%. Now Schumann was successful in attracting interest from both the British and German governments, but World War I disrupted his plans and he died before the war ended. Um, and for a time, Schumann's ideas obviously died with him, especially since the next few years, and especially in the 1920s, witnessed the discovery of many oil and gas reserves around the world. But I suppose that, that the, my main point is that, that perhaps more importantly, the Schumann's technological innovation, um, he in several places, including this one, and Gernsback, sort of contributed to a growing discourse of alternative energy near futures based in this sort of culture of speculative invention, but also fiction. So harnessing the sun was reframed as an objective of sort of industrialized terrestrial modernity, rather than the fantastical energy system of an intergalactic distant future. And this began to play out in fiction. So the Robert Heinlein stories are probably the best examples of this. So I think this, this sort of story reminds us sort of at this time of climate crisis, that solar power is there for us now and that we, you know, we cannot wait for, for the future. And I'll finish speaking there. Thank you for listening.